Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library. And I'm really excited to be here for our conversation about women in sci-fi with Julie Ternada, Murr Lafferty, Kat, Kat Eason. <laughs> I'm gonna call you Kat, but I know it's Kay. Um, Lena Wynn. And um, we're gonna be getting to them in just a minute. But before we do, I just wanna say a couple things. One is, um, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Ashland Library for supporting all of our programs. Without them, we could do none of this. Um, I'd also like to thank the Tewksbury Library and the, I think the Newton Library who <laughs> have patrons here. We uh, work together and we love having um, more and more people from all over Massachusetts and all over the world actually joining us. So we thank our um, partnering libraries. I wanted to let you know that we are having a virtual book sale. So if you want signed books from any of our authors, um, you can do that from Bank Square Books. I will put a link in the chat. When you order them, just say you want them signed in the comments and um, you get a signed book. It's like gold. Um, at least I think so. I mean, as a librarian, I think I have to say that, even though I believe it to be true. <laughs> So, uh, like I said, I'm excited to be here. I'm just going to get started right away. Um, you can put any questions you have in the Q&A. If you have any chat like you just did, just throw it right into the chat and we'll be paying attention to that. So, really quickly, Julie Chernado has been inducted into the Canadian Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame in 2022. I think that's amazing. I think we need to have one of those. Um, Kay, Kay Eason, who I'm going to call Kat. Um, teaches first-year college students about zombies and food, but not all at the same time, thankfully. Mer Lafferty is a podcaster and writer from Durham, North Carolina. Um, her podcasting is called I Should Be Writing, The Angry Robot Pad Podcast, and Escape Pod, the premier science fiction podcast magazine. It's pretty awesome, and um, I'm sure I'll have lots of questions for you about that. Lena is an award-winning writer of speculative fiction and fantasy. She has been uh, studied writing all over the world, and her career is dedicated to writing, which is really amazing because we love her books. So um, instead of me like talking more and more about stuff, I'm going to just hand it over to the authors to tell us about themselves to start, and then we'll get into some deep questions about women in sci-fi. So I'm going to start with Julie. Like, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your latest book. Great, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. I look forward to the discussion and the questions. I'm uh, my background is biology. Uh, I was writing for myself and doing nonfiction textbook kind of things when uh, finally I got my first book bought by Daw and I haven't looked back. So this is my 25th year of being uh, published in novel form. Thank you. I can't believe it either. I feel old, but not really. Uh, this is my latest book. It's a standalone science fiction um, about. Uh, our, our far future, and of course it involves a great deal of miscommunication between aliens and humans and humans and humans, and uh, I'm, I'm very proud of it, and uh, it's great to be here. I love women in science fiction and women who write science fiction. Excellent. Well, you're in the right place. <laughs> um, Mur? Mur. <laughs> Um, I am Mer Lafferty, and uh, no longer with Angry Robot, that was an older bio, but um, yeah, I'm just I most recently did uh, Station Eternity, which is my uh, Agatha Christie meets Babylon 5 murder mystery that came out in October. And I do podcasting and editing and writing and wear a lot of hats. Oh, and I do live streaming on Twitch as well. So I'm uh, pretty classic ADHD and I'm from Durham and uh, I think that's that's it. Um, I do have to point out that her background is thanking the Ashland Library. So that's pretty fantastic. <laughs> Kat, I'm moving on to you. All right. Um, my name is Kat Eason. I'm pretty excited to be here. Uh, I am relatively new to writing um, in the last six years or so. Uh, this is my latest and greatest. With I just love the covers, man, these covers. Uh, this is Nightwatch on the Hinterlands. It came out in November, November, and it's the second in a duology. Um, I, I've always been a writer in my head, but mostly I studied English lit and teach writing and not the fun kind necessarily, but you know, writing is writing. That's what I always tell them. So excited to be here. I have to ask, what is the not fun part, what type of writing? Cause I love reading. So I can't imagine that there's 
so great. My students would say analytical. They're like, oh, it's an English class. I'm like, yeah, but it's about zombies. Chill. It's, it's going to be fine. But they would say analytical academic writing is not fun writing. Okay, I try to I teach them curriculum is, is right up there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely, I get it now. Yeah. Lena? Hi, so I'm Lena. Very excited to be here. Thank you, Ashlyn Public Library, for hosting this awesome discussion. I am very new to writing. My first book came out last year. It's called We Have Always Been Here. Um, And it's a science fiction novel that I kind of describe as alien meets deus ex machina, or ex machina, sorry. Um, it's basically about a psychologist who's voyaging on a, a colonist ship to an alien planet when her patients all start experiencing nightmares and delusions, and she sort of has to figure out this locked room mystery that's going on before things descend into chaos. Um, my background is I got my MFA at Cornell, where I also actually taught a class on zombies and fiction. <laughs> Um, and right now I am writing my next book as well as um, developing my own video game. So yeah, I would love to hear about the Twitch streams and about the zombies and everything. Sounds great. <laughs> I think, are zombies sci-fi or are they more paranormal? We'll dig into that at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask, what drew you to writing specifically in uh specifically sci-fi. Mur? Always paranoid I'm muted or not muted if I'm saying something. Anyway, um, I was a voracious reader as a kid and, um, you know, I remember getting in trouble for bringing too many books on a trip once, but um, I never really wanted to actually tell my own stories until I started reading science fiction that had women and girls as the heroes so a wrinkle in time uh dragon flight those two were very instrumental to me thinking that oh i can tell i can write neat stories about girls doing weird stuff that sounds awesome and so uh never really had interest in doing non-speculative stuff i i i i I can appreciate it when other people do it but if i try to think about a non-speculative story I'm like well that's boring that's just like going to the store it's it's yeah my my imagination doesn't work that way but uh really it was I was always a reader until I started reading girl focused science fiction and then I wanted to be a writer fantastic Kat mm, I was the other way I didn't I didn't see myself in any of the stories I was reading and that annoyed me so I was like hmm I'm I'm just gonna I'm just going to make stuff up. I'm just going to make up stories. So my my stuffed animal collection had remarkable adventures that animals generally don't have, but they did. Um, yeah, so I was always trying to make up stories. My my very active imagination kept me kept me company. Also brought too many books on vacation. Also got in trouble for reading in every available vehicle. You're going to ruin your eyes. True fact, but yes, I did it anyway. You're going to get sick. Hmm willpower um but yeah just i think i think i was first science fiction because i wanted i was thinking about this earlier today where did this come from battlestar galactica the original series had those daggets those little Mm -hmm. metal dogs Mm -hmm. and i wanted a dog really badly and wasn't allowed to have one so i was just sure if i could get a daggett i could have a dog so it was it was all at that point, it was like anything is possible in sci-fi or fantasy because there was The Hobbit. I wanted a dragon too. Why, why share? So it was like anything is possible not in this world that's like going to the store because I agree. Lit fic. I appreciate it, but I don't want to write it. I want to write something else. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Well, that's the magic of the Kindle, isn't it? And we don't get in trouble for taking too many books on trips. Or the any e-reader, I should say. (laughs) Lena? Yeah, so actually growing up, I was a hardcore fantasy reader. Like, you could not get me to really touch anything that didn't have magic in it or swords and, you know, girl knights on horseback and everything. Um, The science fiction books that I did read, those kind of classics, the H.G. Wells and 
um, Dune and everything. While I appreciate them now as an adult, when I was younger, they kind of left me feeling a little cold. Like they're very cerebral, very clinical in a certain sense. Like they had very sweeping worlds, but um, I, I struggled to find kind of that emotional center um, until I read Works in Crake by Margaret Atwood which is more speculative than really hard science fiction, but something about the characters and the way that they interacted with this future was so compelling to me that it kind of opened up this bridge between not just complete secondary world fantasy and like removed from my reality, but a projection of what I could see happening in my present and how I could kind of like fictionalize and fantasize about how to get there. Um, another incident that happened growing up was uh, Siri came out probably when I was like 12 or 13. And it was really funny seeing how the kids around me would almost like fictionalize this piece of technology that they had that we kind of knew how it worked. But the imagination and the fantasy of thinking that she was like their friend was a really interesting phenomenon to me. So I think that really drew me to science fiction and its power. Fascinating. Oh my gosh, Siri. I didn't realize it could be so powerful in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> Julie? Sure. Um, well, it's for science, my love of science fiction started uh, when I think it was about 10 and I was trying to find something new to read, something that wasn't everyday normal stuff. So I just read all the along the shelf in my library until I hit this one book and it was uh, an Andre Norton. And I thought, this is what I've been waiting for, you know, this fiction. So then my dad saw me reading it. So he began bringing me uh, the pulps that he'd been reading that they were now out in paperback, which would have been fine. I wouldn't have been writing except he gave me Tarzan and I read it and I didn't like the ending and he didn't tell me it was continued. So my mother said, fix it. And that was it. I was done. You know, once I had the power to actually take a story and make it mine, that was it. So I wrote for myself for years and years until I was, doing biology research. And then I began to incorporate that into my storytelling in, in, because I can't do those experiments. It's not nice, <laughs> or possible <laughs> even. And it, it wasn't, you know, I was published in fiction, nonfiction before I even thought about sending my fiction out. And when I did, I was a uh, marvelous thing is you can actually make a living at it. It's fantastic. You do it all the time. So it's been my life for quite a long time. Awesome. So, um, now we know why you guys all started, well, you all started writing uh, science fiction, but why do you think it's so popular for readers? And I'm gonna start with Kat for that one. Mm. You can pass if you want. <laughs> no, I'm, I think it gives you, and, and understand that I'm coming from students who often push back if I try and teach science fiction, they get mad and like, this is weird. Yes, it's weird. That's the point. Um, but I think I think it's it's a draw because it gives us another lens with which to look at the world, and and sort of here are the here are issues. Dink. Let's set them over there, and suddenly, oh, it's we can see race, we can see this, we can see that, we can see all of these big issues. We can see the military industrial complex, or you know, like one of the early books I read was C.J. Cherry's Cytine which probably a 15 year old, that was a lot, but it was also like, oh, 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 like this is a thing. So it's, it's being able that, that giving your imagination a way to imagine what the world could be like if we go down this path, if we go down this path, if we tried this, new perspectives always let you see more or learn more. And I think some people are really drawn to that. Mm -hmm. Lena? Yeah, I think I would agree with everything that Kat said. Um, I think it's a way of recontextualizing the issues that we're facing or, or beginning to face in our present day in a way that uh, is engaging and compelling to us. I also think that science fiction in looking at the future in its in its unique way offers a sense of like hope and optimism a lot of times that I think especially of like of this most current generation, they're really drawn to science fiction for those reasons. Mm -hmm. So true, I think. Julie? It's interesting uh, listening to this because uh, one of the things I did for many years was I used science fiction in the classroom. And one of the reasons I used it in, in science classrooms was 
to let students imagine uh, the dire consequences or the possible influences of things in a safe way. Like they would put in a story and it would be no less powerful. By the end, they might be weeping, but they think they're safe when they start. We all think we're safe when we start writing a book. <laughs> but So it, it has that power to let us experiment with, with both dire things and amazing things. And I'm with you on the optimism. That's always where I go with mine. But it's also, um, it's powerful. And it's interesting that I've seen it become more mainstreamish. Um, a lot of that with a lot of the, of the film and the games that have brought a generation who might have thought, that's not for me, from fantasy into science fiction. Not most, I think, are still reading fantasy, but they're coming. It's nice. Mm -hmm. Mariah, uh, skipped over you. I'm so sorry. I lost my circle when I reformatted my <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> Well, you know, I can't see your circle, so I didn't think you skipped over me at all. Okay. Um, I, uh, science fiction can address a lot of society's problems in a different lens, and it's very important. But um, I will point out the fact that it's also escapism, and that is what I find a lot of pleasure in reading and writing. Um, there's I think when people talk about Litfic and this amazing book that they're reading and it's got divorce and assault and uh, it ends badly and it's everyone's favorite book and Reese Witherspoon can't stop talking about it. I'm like, that's depressing. I don't want that. I just don't want it. And, you know, you give me Becky Chambers and people wandering around in a spaceship and having fun and you know there's conflict but there's also hugs it's it's like a virtual hug and uh sometimes that's what i need so i think for me science fiction uh and that's what i try to bring to people as well and sometimes i feel bad that i'm not writing what some people would consider as important but then you know when someone tells you that they read your book while they're you know sitting in the hospital while their mother was dying and you made them laugh it's like oh the escapism is important too so that's um kind of what i really treasure about it. I think you all hit on a um, uh, comment that Gary actually said that sometimes he they use um, sci-fi for relaxing and comfort and other times for stretching their mind. So, um, you know, obviously it has a lot of components to it that we can uh, tap into wherever we are in our moods. Um, so my next question really is, what is your favorite thing about writing sci-fi? Lena, I'm going to start with you about this. Ooh, my favorite thing about writing sci-fi. I don't know that this is science fiction specific, but I think just characters, like in any genre, in any form, those are um, just so captivating to me. These kind of figures that spring fully formed in your mind, and sometimes you have to wrestle for control with them, and it's this sort of bizarre loving conflict that you can engage with with your own mind but also with these people that feel like they're not really of you um yeah so I I continue to be fascinated by that part of the writing process just the ability for writers to just create entirely new people let alone entirely different worlds mm -hmm. more I don't I, I don't know if this is science fiction specific but it's just the I guess like like Kat, I was also just making up tons and tons of stories. And then when I learned I could write them down and then I'm a hardcore pantser. And um, the thrill I get when my story goes in a direction I didn't expect and I didn't know it was going to go there until I was in the middle of writing it. That's that's like that's a dopamine hit unlike anything else. It's um, and science fiction just makes it more fun. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Julie. Well, I have actually, a, I like science fiction because I love science fiction, period. But also for me, it's easier to write. Um, I've written some fantasy novels. Those take me a great deal more work, uh, partly because I'm just an information junkie and I just collect science bits and biology bits and I just can't wait to spew them forth on the page and make a world, make aliens make communication systems that are going to require snot, you know, so these just are my particular joy, as, as, as Merv quite rightly said, you know, that dopamine feeling, I get that when I get to put something from the real world 
somewhere you don't see it coming. And for me, in science fiction, that's the easiest playground. And it's just, it's always just joyful. I would like to read about your snot filled machines. <laughs> Kat? What do I like best? Okay, characters, yes. World building, I think. Um, and I would, I don't know that I write science fiction, not in the hard sense for sure, because I've definitely got a science fantasy element. But I think it's the world building, um, whether I'm writing what any kind of spec fic, it's the world building that I'm into of, okay, let's make a consistent functioning society, a world, a complexity, a, you know, languages, snot computers, or whatever, you know, math magic, whatever, how, do, what are the rules of this world? And how does that then from there affect everything, all the way down to the characters? If I start on a character level, which I always do, it's like, why are you like this? Why are you like that? Like, why are you this way in my head? Why did you just get mad? I didn't want you to get mad on this page. You just got mad. Why did you get mad? And then figuring out how the world builds from there. That's, that's my dopamine head. Okay. I see there's a lot of dopamine going on here. <laughs> Lots of dopamine. So, um, so I'm going to start digging into a little bit of the topic of the day, which is women in um, writing sci-fi. And really, my first question is, is it something that, that you had to fight for? Were there challenges to starting in writing sci-fi? Because, you know, people think of Isaac Asimov or H.G. Wells. Um, so I'm just wondering what has been your personal experience with um, starting to write sci-fi or, or specifically. Mer? I, I've not encountered a lot of pushback uh, because of gender. Um, I know it exists. I totally, but I, I haven't luckily have not experienced it. The weird thing is when um, usually an older man finds out I write science fiction, his first thought is, wow, not a lot of women do that, do they? And we're like, yes, we, we do. We are. We have been. We always have been. And then he tells me his favorite science fiction author's eyes of Isaac Asimov. And then I don't need to hear anything else because he's been dead a long time and lots of people have written books since. So um, it, it's more people being surprised that that we exist. But um, I haven't gotten a lot of crap. My I mean, my parents supported me since I started telling stories and I've been very grateful for that. And I when I went in. When I tried to do science fiction in school, um, I got more pushback because of science fiction. Um, but, you know, I found a mentor pretty early that was very instrumental to me. And, um, you know, I think I've been really lucky. But it's more just people who seem surprised that, that we're even here. That's about it. Mm. Julie? It's interesting because I didn't even know, and I thought all authors were dead, to be honest. I thought they only got pub published posthumously when I was younger. Which, so it was a revelation to me when I even discovered some of these people like C.J. Cherry were women because I actually literally didn't care. I could tell more by how they wrote. And what used to frustrate me no end was, I don't mind a puzzle short story, but I really dislike a puzzle novel with a female victim or a female stupid person, um, because that's not believable to me. I just didn't, I couldn't believe those books. So I just said, I'm not gonna look at you and I will find others. And it was remarkably easy. And when I started looking at my shelves, I realized a lot of the writers that I would consider my favorite in all time have been women. And for whatever reason, whether they felt like me and wrote this way or what it was, but their characters seem more relatable and believable, even if they were men. So to some extent, I saw that coming. The only pushback I ever had was actually quite, quite nasty. I was a guest of honor at a very at a small convention uh, in the states, and I was very proud of myself. This was fairly early on, and the uh, the the con chair came up to me and I said, "Oh, you know, here's I'm signing at the, in the dealer's room, and I hear all my books." And he goes, "Well, I'll wait till you write fantasy because I don't read women science fiction writers." And I must admit, I didn't take that personally. I just thought, what's your loss? You know, I'm sorry. <laughs> but since then, no, I don't think so. I mean, I've got the name like Julie, you know, I mean, people know what they're getting. So it hasn't seemed to hurt the sales, I hope. 
can't imagine that it would in this day and age, hopefully. <laughs> um, Kat? Not personally. Um, it's, I've seen, I mean, obviously I've seen a lot of it happening around me, but I got, I got into publishing relatively late. So late ish for me. Um, but I had, I remember having conversations with, I, I was going to say friends, but not really, not if they're going to say this to me, but I don't read women writers because they don't ever get it. You know, I don't read women sci-fi writers or I don't read, you know, whatever this, and I didn't have the, your loss. I had the much more profane reaction. Um, and so I, and my, one of my favorite authors in the world is CJ Cherry. And I realized real quick, like, hmm, maybe, maybe the initials is the way to go. Like, maybe that's, maybe that's a thing that I should maybe think about doing. So I think I was prepared for more of it than I got, but because, but I think I've also been kind of lucky because I don't do a lot of cons and I don't do a lot of, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to speak to that because it was funny because I was published extensively in nonfiction under Julie E. Trinata. And so when I, you know, Sheila Gilbert at Daw bought my first novel, I went to my publisher and I said, the nonfiction publisher, I said, well, is it okay if I publish under my name? It's going to be science fiction. And they said, absolutely. You have no idea what credibility it gives us to have an actual real writer. And I thought, isn't that interesting? All these people slaving away writing nonfiction do not consider themselves real writers until there's a book on like a fiction novel out there I feel the same so you know that part of it was different but yeah, yeah. um Lena yeah I I've been very fortunate to join a long tradition of female science fiction writers and I personally haven't experienced any pushback based on my gender or any the most challenging part of science fiction for me is comments saying that my science fiction isn't scientifically accurate and navigating that you know the the wavery line between total fantasy and sorry and aliens and everything versus um yeah just uh you know rigorous research um could this actually happen in our reality that's basically the thing that i've tried to navigate but um when it comes to who I am as a person, I haven't really faced any challenges on that front. But um, it has been interesting having a science fiction novel with an Asian female protagonist, at least in terms of talking about maybe adap adapting the book into like a film or a movie. There have been talks about that, but because of the pool for actresses who um, could embody that starring role, is still quite limited. That's basically about the only thing that we've come up against. I was going to ask about your Asian heritage about, um, and because some, uh, being Asian myself, I know my parents would be like, writer, you can be a writer, be a doctor, be a lawyer, you know? <laughs> so I don't know if you had that additional, you know, uh, uh, whatever from your family. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my parents are actually very, very supportive. From a very young age, I was writing, like, devouring Lord of the Rings and, um, you know, testing really well in school and writing and reading. So they just really leaned into it. And they sacrificed a lot to be able to send me to writing summer camps and, you know, early education programs at, like, Stanford and Harvard, um, just to make sure that I could really, like, work on that skill and flourish. It wasn't until I was working on the book and not having like a day job, I had quit teaching at Cornell to sort of finish the draft of my book that they started to get a little worried, like, oh, maybe when you're done, like maybe you could go back to school or maybe you could. But then when the book got bought, all of a sudden it was like, we always knew it, you know, so <laughs> they've been very supportive and I've been very lucky. That's awesome. Um, okay, so Achilles has a really interesting question. It's a little bit long, but I'm going to read the whole thing because it's a lot of, um, it's, it's a very good question. Um, he's currently in Massachusetts, and I've heard critiques from the literary fiction people that sci-fi can only ex reproduce problems of our time, examples, aliens as a metaphor for xenophobia. I think to an extent for sci-fi to be effective, you have to reproduce those issues. So can we examine them, recontextualize them, as Lena said? So my question is, how do you make sure your fiction examines appropriately and su successfully the problems of our world without problematically reproducing them or being didactic about them? Um, interestingly, I had a similar question, but not that well written. 
Um, <laughs> so I'm going to start with Mur on this one. Oh, you should start with the academic folks. <laughs> mm. I mean, I, I, I don't think about those kinds of metaphors when I'm writing. I mean, I'm sure it slips in because, you know, you can only write about, like you said, you write about what you experience. Um, I try very hard to, on edits, I try very hard to watch my fiction for appropriation or thinly veiled um, references to other things. Um, but I'm not trying to, <laughs> I, I, I don't really use, use it as big metaphors, um, consciously. So that's, that's about it. About the only, it, it, as political as I get would be, I try really hard to have a lot of different kinds of people in my stories and a lot of, uh, women characters. And that's, you know, but when it comes to like metaphors for, uh, I'm very literal. It, I'm in my forties and I'm finally accepting the fact that I'm very literal and I'm just going to go with it. I, I, so when it comes to broad thinking about themes and metaphors, I, I just don't go there. I don't know. That's why I was saying you should go with the academic folks. <laughs> I'm still going in my circle. So, <laughs> okay. Um, Julie. I think that was an excellent answer. Uh, for me, no, really, for me coming from a person who wrote just for themselves for like 20 odd years, uh, I had was doing it as escapism. I was doing it to experiment. I was answering questions about science and where this idea would take me and how far could I stretch it? Like what if we were, if something was immortal, what would they do for fun? You know, just really kind of stretching those ideas out. And you bring to what you write, what you care about. And you, for me, I often bring to what I write what I don't see anywhere else. So a lot of um, my books have friendship. A lot of my books have found family, which I didn't even know was a term, but now I embrace that because I do that all the time. And all my endings are messy. Nobody, there's no clear winner, villain, good guy, bad guy. It is a compromise. And that's probably partly because I'm Canadian and I think that way but it makes me happy. It makes me satisfied to have an ending that is not straightforward. And if I look back at my early work and I say, if I look hard at it and I don't think it's me, maybe I was doing something, but I didn't do it on purpose. It just came from who I am and what I care about. Mm -hmm. So it's as authentic as it can be. Kat, I'm getting to the academics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see that. Um... I'm I'm actually rereading this. I have questions about what we mean by examines appropriately and successfully. Like, qua? What? Um, sometimes, sometimes the world you create looks a lot like this one in all of its ugly. And there's the intersections of race and class and sex and who has and who doesn't and who has the power and who doesn't have the power and who has the privilege and who doesn't have the privilege. And sometimes those worlds are just messy as hell. And that's kind of what I want to write because sometimes I want to get into the messy and break it or get into the messy and be like, you see how messy this is? Why did I have to make them not human beings for you to see how messy this is? Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know that on the on the flip side, if I don't want to deal with the problems, I, I kind of disagree with the people who are telling Achilles that we have to sci-fi has to deal with the problems of the day. No, it doesn't actually. Let's let's imagine Becky Chambers. Let's imagine a world in which let's imagine her robot her robot world, right? On her moon, I can't remember the name of it offhand. I've just I could I have pictures in my head. But let's imagine a world where all of it's been fixed. It's been solved. It's been, here's this future, this, you, I don't want to say utopia because there's still issues, but the warm hug world. Let's imagine everything broke. What would it look like if everything was right? You know, so I think, I think sci-fi is, and spec fic is 
and fantasy is infinitely flexible. If I could just interject, one of the things for me is, is I will go after an issue that I'm passionate about in a short story. That's me, for me, the venue I will use. In a novel, I'm with the hug, I'm with the, I'm here for months and I am not going to make a world I don't choose to spend my time in. Thank you, thank you, Kat. Lena. Yeah, I would agree with Kat that initially when I read the question, I, I found myself tripping up a little bit over um, kind of science fiction can only be effective if it reproduces the problems of today. I'm not sure that I fully agree with that premise. I think a lot of science fiction is sort of like Dune, you know, like we're on a desert planet and there's worms and like spice and everything. And um, I don't know that it's always intentionally and deliberately set out with these specific critiques or themes in mind. Certainly for my writing, I don't set out a story thinking that there's a specific problem I'm not only going to represent, but also tackle. Um, if it does appear, it is because I'm informed by the society that I live in, but it's not something that I'm purposefully trying to do with my plot. You know, I'm writing about a person on a spaceship um, having political cons conspiracies and murders and robots who are malfunctioning. And that's what's kind of how it, that's what has my mind racing. And if sort of these other issues creep in, like corporate privacy laws or um, things that are relevant to today, I think that's more incidental or it's more of a frame than it is kind of like the goal or the destination for me. Mm -hmm. And any of you can answer this. Do you think that there's something about the reader, what we read into what you put out there that is different for each reader? And that might be why it feels like we're there's some reproduction going on there. The minute a book is out and in the hands of readers, it's not my book. You know, the, the interface, I can never read what I write the way someone does when they come to it when it's been finished and it exists as its own entity. And I'm aware of that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's exciting that, that it goes through someone else's brain and comes out with some other way, but it's so out of my control. And you're right, people will, the expression read into it is literally true. They will read into it what they want from it or what, triggers them, triggers them somehow. Yeah. yeah, once it's out of, yeah, it's once it's out of our hands, it's like, mm. I mean, I, I would like to imagine that there are limits to the reading that somebody could get out of it because words mean things and they're on the page and they're in a particular order. Like, this is not a book about unicorns. You can't say this is a book about unicorns. There are no unicorns in this book, <laughs> but uh, whatever. I had a, um, a, I tried to do a hundred word short story once and uh, spoiler, it's, it's basically about uh, Lucifer getting his power back and getting ready to destroy the world. And the way someone read it was that Lucifer was redeemed and it was a hundred word story. I didn't have a lot of room to choose the words. And that is when I fully learned that yeah, it's out of my hands. <laughs> I There was nothing I could, I'm like, wow, you read it like that. Okay, that's, that's, that's how you read it. Great. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. I, I completely agree. I think when it's out of our hands, it's kind of like out in the world and it's going to interact with the world exactly how people want it to. And there's nothing I can do to control that. But I am excited to hear about people's takes because often they make me sound a lot smarter than I actually am. It's kind of like, oh, wow, I really enjoyed what you did. And it's like, yeah, I definitely did that on purpose. But <laughs> um, I think the most fun thing is when people tell me, you know, how they envision like settings or the characters, because they're often so vastly different from how I imagined or described them. And I just love that. I think it's just like a kaleidoscope of like a mini universe that just keeps like branching out the more people interact with it. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, we all, all bring our own experiences to bear no matter what we're doing. So um, I'm going to go back to the, the women in sci-fi thing, because you've talked about writing as a woman in sci-fi. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of being like the, I'm doing the, uh, like the pronoun thing, you know, I know there's more than two 
I'm being binary and I know that there's more than that, but right now we're just talking, I think about like uh, the female perspective in, um, or the not male perspective, I'll say in sci-fi. So um, in writing, and when you're writing and you're writing the women characters, um, how do you keep them? I guess my question, and somebody said this earlier was, how can, how do you create them to be the heroes of these stories? Is it more realistic for them to be heroes in these stories? Because remember in Star Wars, you know, Princess Leia with the bikini, and that's the thing people remember about her. They don't remember her all the time that she's a general. I mean, like she was amazing, right? But there was a bikini scene. So how do you create your women characters, your female characters in, in science fiction to make sure that they can be the heroes of their stories? I think I'm gonna start with Kate, Kat with this. I've sort of lost my, my circle. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I'm just going to say, I just do. It's just because they're the, they have agency. Let me, let me just boil it down to that. They have agency. And in defense of Leia and that bikini, she strangled Jabba the Hutt with a chain, the very <laughs> chain she was chained with. And she did it in her bikini. So I don't know. She's still kind of a, hmm, she's tough. Um, just it's the agency, honestly. How do I make my characters the heroes? Any character, my women are are the heroes because they have agency. And I think that's the big thing in all of the fiction that I hated growing up and I was so mad at growing up was the girls were just, you know, they were just there. They were to be rescued. Exactly. They were to be rescued. They were just, huh, ah, princess in the tower, vomit. So, or just not there at all. And I'm looking at you, Tolkien. I'm looking at you, Hobbit. <laughs> but yeah. not that we're out. calling anybody out, but <laughs> it, well, a little bit, a little bit. I mean, I I love Tolkien and I love the Hobbit, but there's yeah. Anyway, agency. There's my answer. Love it, Lena. Yeah, I think that um, it was uh, a struggle for me to decide whether or not as a science fiction heroine, my main character, Park, and we have always been here, was going to be kind of like that badass Ripley, like in your face, kicking down doors, like flame throwing, like aliens and stuff, or someone more like me who has no athletic skills to speak of, and, <laughs> but can still be a heroine in her own right. And I think, um, yeah, agency and intelligence and making decisions that aren't going to have people just like, why would you do that? You know, completely disconnecting from the fate and concern over the well-being of that character. And I think that's what I focus on, um, male or female. It's more about the accessibility and how how relatable that person can be in the circumstances that they're placed in. Mm -hmm. Great. More? Um. Yeah, agency is a big part of it. I guess I, I I I think about it as I put somebody into a weird situation and uh you know, like Lena said, it's she she may have abilities, but really it's 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 often somebody you don't expect I, I lean towards humor a lot. And a classic humor plot line is you take somebody who doesn't know what they're doing and put them in a terrible situation and they never give up. If they give up, it's not humor. If they don't give up, it is humor. And so it's like putting taking somebody who's kind of knows what she's doing, but not entirely and putting her in a situation and no, she's not going to, you know, kick ass and take names she's probably just gonna try to figure out the best way to cobble her way out of it or macgyver her way out of it um yeah so it's it's more of just i i guess i think of it as as i don't knit the people together until i throw problems at them and then see how they react so I, that's kind of a backwards way of going about it i guess but that that seems that's what comes to mind Okay, so being able to handle anything that comes at them. Yeah. Julie? Do it a bit the other way around. Um, because I'm I, in my science fiction, at least, I always have a question I'm asking and I want to play with that. I'm, I'm doing a mind experiment of some sort. So 
the protagonist that I'm going to deal with has to be someone who legitimately the reader will believe uh, has some interest in that problem, will be affected by it, uh, has at least a shot at understanding what's going on. So um, when I had something that it was involving migration of species across uh, galactic space or whatever, I, my main character is a salmon researcher because she understands the biological drive. She understands the techniques and tools of biology. And she hates aliens and doesn't want to have anything to do with them, which makes her much more interesting when she's forced into an alien bathroom, which is exactly what you mean, Mervyn, by putting people in unusual and uncomfortable situations and seeing what happens. But there's always this sense, I find it very helpful to always have a character that is moving through that question who has a legitimate shot at answering it isn't we're going to rely on someone else or may know how to bring other people into her conversation. I like collaboration as well between my characters. So that's sort of my, my mind process. And then they can go nuts and have bikinis and whatever. <laughs> I mean, if, anything, if you want to put them in a bikini, that seems legit. Maybe, maybe they like bikinis. A unicorn. <laughs> or a unicorn. I, hey, there's some scary unicorns in the world. So speaking of unicorns, um, this is a, this is an odd question because I'm a, I'm also a romance reader. I think I was telling Julie and Mer that a little bit a while ago. So when you're creating your characters, do you like, I mean, you actually have to like, when they're doing their physical attributes, you make sure they're anatomically correct so that they could have relations with humanoids, um, you know, and, and then how do you build from there? <laughs> Not just the physicality, but their personalities, I'll say. Um, but the the physicality is my interest, the point I'm interested in. <laughs> um, and I'm starting with Lena with this. Do, uh, are you talking about alien characters or do you mean to, ah, my book doesn't have alien characters, but it does have Android characters. And um, in sort of the flashback sequences for this main character, she has kind of a caregiver slash bodyguard who kind of helps raise her from, you know, teenager onward up until she goes to college. And it results in very confusing feelings for her because for all intents and purposes, he resembles like a male human, um, but he's a robot. And so she sort of projects these interactions and feelings onto him in sort of that cringy teenage girl way of like, is he flirting with me? But he's just a robot. Um, and I think navigating that kind of strange dynamic was one of my favorite parts in the book of just her believing that she had like love for this robot. And those were very real feelings on her part and having to come to the realization that he was not capable of those feelings was, um, some, like a big emotional part of the book that I focused on a lot, but in anatomy wise, I never really had to think about it like, because I never got that far. <laughs> That's okay. I always think of Data from Star Trek, The Next Generation, you know, the episode where he's like, oh, I'm fully functional. Um, right. So, <laughs> just had to ask. Mer? I have not made my aliens and humans sexually compatible. Um, I I don't know. I, I can't tell you how I came up with my aliens. It, it feels like so long ago and it felt like an organic process. And But they're the, none of the aliens are as wet as humans are, and they find us very disgusting. And especially when th th there's there's one of my favorite scenes in the book is has a a man getting very injured, and he's he's very bloody. And there's an alien there, and she's like, "I would like to go help people, but I probably shouldn't leave this wet bag of ick just here." So she's like carrying him around the station, just utterly disgusted, trying, because she knows she has to save his life, but there's too much going on to actually you know, hand him to a medical professional. And so she's just like carrying this bag of wet human around and she's horrified. And so I've not actually made the humans attractive to them either. So I haven't thought about that. Um, I actually, th I haven't thought about sex within the aliens either which i probably should at some point at least at least i should know <laughs> nobody heard that never mind i i've got it all figured out you just don't get to know <laughs> we'll see it all in your next book <laughs> um julie 
It's an interesting question. I do have one series that has a lot of romance in it, and it's and it's it's a humanoid alien that they, they can actually pass for humans. So you know, really, except for the fact they can't procreate, uh, produce anything, they can have lots of fun. So that worked. But I just I I just sold a um, my first erotic alien uh, short story, and I wrote it. I think because I well, first I hadn't done one, and I thought I'm going to see what I can do. But it, it turned out to be incredibly tender and, and incredibly special and, and 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 really nothing is is happening in a way that either one expects, but it's satisfying. So I, I, I had a lot of uh, joy out of that. But one of the, the tricks is to not be too specific. Let the reader use their power for good <laughs> and figure out what all that might, what that means. And oh my goodness, have some fun. Makes me think of um, that movie, The Shape of Chocolate. I uh, know, The Shape of Water. Oh, you yes. know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cat. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Mmm, my mm, alien alien sex. Um, we'll say anatomy. <laughs> anatomy. Well, there was the romance element. So, uh, I don't. Um, sorry, I'm I'm thinking about a lot of different aliens. Some of them are absolutely not biologically compatible, as in in environmental suits. Um, some of them are mildly toxic, like the body fluids. Mm -mm. And there was a <laughs> there was a book that I threw away at ninety three thousand words, that eventually turned around and became a different book entirely. But it had some of the same characters. But the sex between non physically compatible, the romance between non physically compatible creatures happened virtually. So you would plug something into to, into a socket at the base of your skull or wherever your nerve bundles were and it would be a virtual interaction where your parts weren't corrosive or you weren't getting cut on the other person's spines or bits and mm, both <laughs> horrific but also you know better living through technology i mean yeah why not why not that might still happen in another book i don't know i told my agent she's like why didn't you write that i was like because the plot sucked sorry <laughs> sorry it just wasn't working one thing i have fun with is the consequences of sex so in one of my books um you know the, the aliens once they've procreated they basically bring a bag of offspring and hang it on the door of whoever they think is going to be you know willing to take care of them and of course this bag of babies gets trots around all over and sometimes humans have to look after them i think you've got to do the care if you're going to have the fun so <laughs> i found that one that's awesome too. Um, so Gail says, what does science fiction mean to you? I've seen books like A Discovery of Witches, Outlander Timeline by Crichton and Malaville by Robert Merle listed as science fiction, very different books. Do they feel sci-fi sci -fi is different than science fantasy? Um, Lena? Um, I don't know. I think that's really subjective. It really depends on everybody's own um, interpretation. I I feel like my definition of science fantasy or science fiction is any um, story in which science or technology or some projection of the future, be it completely hypothetical or somewhat grounded in our reality, is forms like the main premise. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you could probably describe, I haven't read Outlander, but if there's time travel and if it's somewhat scientific, then I guess it would be science fiction in some way. Um, yeah, I think there is a difference between science fiction and science fantasy, but I, off the top of my head, I don't know if I can articulate it. I, it's almost like uh, it's a gut feeling, <laughs> kind of. You know it when you see it, but I don't know if I have like a strict rubric for it. Um, Mur? I don't think we're drunk enough and we're not at a sci-fi con to actually discuss this question um th this this is the the forming of of you know fist fights at conventions uh -huh. discussing uh -huh. genre like this um going back to what lena said early on um when i did a lot of research for one scientific aspect of a previous book and i totally hand waved another aspect i got dinged for the science on the stuff I actually researched and that's when I realized you're not going to please everybody and I'm just going to make stuff up the way I want I know this sounds cruel but you know the people who 
only want science fiction that is 100% possible, like no FTL, all that. I think they're joyless. I it, it makes me so sad to hear people say that they only want to read stuff like that. I'm like, do you, I mean, imagination, <laughs> have you heard the word? Um, I, I always wondered if Anne McCaffrey purposefully tried to pull the rug out from people by writing so many books about dragons and then telling us that it was all genetically enhanced. So technically, dragon writers have heard it's science fiction. But then again, when you get into the fact that nobody could raise enough sheep to keep those dragons alive, then we go into the, the fantasy part again. So um, I, I just... I, I don't like to worry about genre because there are, I, I would just, you know, spiral downwards if I think about it too much. So I just, I make stuff up and if people like it, awesome. And if they don't, if, if they don't think it fits their genre, it's, there's plenty of books. Yeah. And um, of the getting drunk or going to a con, we can remedy one of those um, if you want. <laughs> Julie? <laughs> Yes, I, I agree with everything we said. It's, it's, a, it's a thankless debate in some respects. The other side of it is, is I edit anthologies and they're themed. And so I would have a, a science fiction anthology and I would have a fantasy anthology. And I would distinguish between them mostly from the point, point of view of if you took the science fiction question about something out of the story and it's still a good story, then it's not science fiction. You didn't need that. Um, you could tell Star Wars if you just replace the planets with castles and the, the the ships with horses, and you could still tell the same powerful story. It's just not as beautiful to watch and as, as immersive and escapist as it is. Um, so, but, but when I write my own stuff, I, I I found to write fantasy was was a very difficult process for me. It took me about three years to write my first fantasy novel because I love it so much, and the writing of fantasy, I love reading it. Uh, because I had to get out of that mindset of getting as much as I can write so I don't blow the reader out of the story while giving them something really speculative at the same time. I, I'm good with science and doing that. Fantasy was harder for me. So it, to me, it's if you can enjoy it, it's a wonderful story. It's a great story. I don't care what you call it. If you're going to tell me it's, it's science fiction, I want to know there's some speculation about the future, about our relationship with robots, about uh, how you can use a harp to modify a program, you know, all these kind of wonderful ideas and space stations with murders. Like, that's science fiction to me. I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. Kat? Oh, genre. Um... <laughs> genre convention. Okay, so this is, <laughs> this is a thing that I teach, um, unfortunately, for all of us. Um, genre conventions are not fixed. They are... There may be a list of criteria, but not everything has to hit all of those marks at every single time to be part of a genre. And so I think where where things break or bend or get funky is where things get interesting. Because I'm I'm kind of with Murr on, I'm sorry, if all you want is the same story over and over and over and over again, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Why? Why are you so sad? Um <laughs> I like to see the places where things break. I think if I had to go with what makes sci-fi different than sci-fantasy, might be the attitude, might be, are you scientific materialist? Like, are you looking for physical, is there, do you think there is an answer to something that we can find with some sort of a process? Or do you fall back on the sort of mythic as, as your answer to things? Um, and that would probably be, that yeah, I, that's about the only thing I can think of. Otherwise, I'm like, read what you read, write what you write, break the genres, just break them, rebuild them. Mm -hmm. It's like Legos; you get something cool. It's true, and I actually I always have trouble with the sci fantasy thing. I don't even really use that as a term. I mean, there's to me there's this there's that direction to fantasy, and there's the direction to to super hard, like a, basically hard SF that will be a thriller in two years once we invent the things. So I like that the middle ground where there's so much possibility and play and, and uh, imagination because we need more imagination. No, that's, that's, that's interesting. I want to try to write magic in space, like magic, magic, flat out. This is what we're going to call it magic, not nanotechnology 
borderline tech magic. No, no, freaking magic. So that's that's my next plan to see if I can even build a world where this functions. We'll see. We'll see. Lena, do you have something to add? Me? Yeah, I just saw you unmuted. So I thought maybe you wanted to jump in. Oh, no, I was just doing that in anticipation of the next question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so we're, uh, it's almost eight o'clock, actually, believe it or not. So I'm just going to take one more question from our attendees. And then I have a couple of um, like sort of ending questions. Um, Lisa asks, and I have the same question, I think it's one you probably get all the time is where do you get your ideas from? She specifically asked, do you dream about science fiction themes, or the books you're writing? Um, and if not, where do you get your ideas? Mer? One time I had a very, very awesome fantasy dream and I tried to write it and it was an absolute disaster. Uh, the, the, <laughs> unfortunately, the thing about dreams, at least for me, is that they're so tied to your emotional subconscious with things that you, for some reason, your brain attributes as very emotional. And so you you have these very important dreams with aspects and then you try to put them down on paper and try to tell other people why they're important and it just or at least for me, it didn't work. Um, so I don't really dream in that aspect. I I guess I get a lot of my ideas from just absorbing other media, um, you know, in, in thinking, well, that's an interesting idea. What if it went in this direction instead? I, I didn't, it took me a very long time to realize that a lot of my stuff is just looking at something from a very literal point of view. Like I said, I'm very literal. So I look at things like Murder, She Wrote and go, why does anybody hang out with this woman? I would be terrified. I would be sure that I would die if I were near her. And so I made a woman who people die around her and she solves the murders, but no one cares. No one wants to be around her. And so she runs away to a space station because she thinks maybe if she hangs out with other people, she'll be okay. And so I think I look at common stories and wonder how if I took it literally, which direction it would go. It just, I only recently realized this, so it was not a conscious thought. Julie? Funny you should ask that, because uh, before this panel, I was uh, reading a little more on the, in, in An Immense World by Ed Young, and I had got to the part where if we could hear the decibel, if we could hear what bats, uh, echolocation sonar calls sound like, they're generating that ultrasound at the same decibel level as a jet plane taking off. We would be deafened by it. And I'm just sitting around thinking, I'm surrounded by sound that would deafen me if I could hear it. And, and what am I going to use that for? But I'm going to use that. So for some of it, it's just that frisson of things. You get that goosebump knowing you've got an idea coming and, uh, and where it's going to go, I don't know. But their ideas are the easy part. They're everywhere. It's, it's coalescing them into something that will make sense to another brain is the tricky part. Yep. I've never heard that it's said so well before. <laughs> Kat? Ideas are easy. It's, it's the plotting that's the hard part. Like, I, yeah, I can, I can throw out a thousand ideas. Uh, I get a lot of my idea, ideas. Not, not, I get a lot of my shapes for things, true fact, from playing D&D. &D, because either as a player or as a DM, you're always trying to figure out story and interaction and story and interaction. So I get my ideas from interesting conflict, like, because con conflict is what drives a story, whether it's two characters arguing in a scene or intergalactic nonsense or whatever. So always looking for, for the breaks in things and the seams in things and those, those liminal spaces and the border spaces where things don't fit neatly. And then, oh, okay. It's those breaking places where I start looking for how can a story happen here what what movement needs to happen here lena yeah um i only dream about my books um or their characters when i'm kind of like in my peak writing like halfway through the book and i'm like my product my productivity is at its highest i actually used to do this thing like i used to dream write where I would literally be asleep, but I would be writing in my head and I could see like the page and the words and I would go back and delete and like rewrite as I was going. And then I would wake up and I could just like write down what I had written in my sleep. And it was actually good. Like it was, it was a very bizarre phenomenon and it still happens sometimes, but only when I'm already 
like through a like halfway through a project, not before. Um, my inspiration tends to come from basically absorbing media. And I find that visual video games and movies and TV shows really gives me that spark of inspiration because it just allows me to see how scenes and colors and things can would play out in my head. Um, obviously reading, um, but I have to be very judicious about it because I, if I read in the same genre that I'm intending to write in and like you read something you really love and you're like, oh my gosh, why didn't I think of this first? But then you can't like you, you you're you almost mad about it because you, then you feel guilty like incorporating it because you read it already. <laughs> so I have to be very careful when I often will read like the opposite genre of what I'm writing, but to like still absorb that prose and all the delicious like characters and everything. <laughs> I love it. That was actually one of my questions about if you guys, uh, if y'all read um, it sci-fi as well while you're writing it. But um, Gail says that she's glad that there are for you, there are no rules to writing sci-fi. I think that's great. Um, so just really quickly, I'm just gonna lightning round. I want you to recommend a book by a woman author that is not on this panel, sci-fi, <laughs> Julie. Okay, well, I will definitely go with uh, CJ Cherry's Forder series, which I believe is in its, I don't know how many trilogy, it, and she's done the next one and it's coming. So they are just, they're just wonderful. There's like 20 some at this point. I, I love them. I, when they come there, out of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like another, one's, another one's coming. So yes, definitely that one. Okay. I'm writing that down. Kat. Oh no. Bump me. Bump me. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Oh, Lena. I, Foreigner was mine. So now I have to look at my bookshelf and yeah, like, yeah. try to think of another one. Okay, Maris, you're up. <laughs> uh, Martha Wells Murderbot series. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Can I do okay. another CJ Cherry, the Faded Sun trilogy. <laughs> I mean, I'll I'll jump on the cherry. Citine. Okay. Citine. Right. That was Channel my series. world bent. Chan. I mean, all the cherry. Just read cherry. Just go read cherry. Just go. Just go read cherry. Well, I asked this. I I think you said Becky Chambers. Somebody said Becky Chambers. Becky okay. Chambers yeah. and I've yeah, my book club list. If I went and dug up my book club list, I would know. Um, Becky Chambers, definitely the monk and robot. Oh, what is her name? There was oh, something. Oh, Juliet this Wade and her and her, um, her Tower series is just amazing. Just amazing, Juliet Wade. Yeah, and obviously N.K. Jemison. Um, yes, yes. Broken. Sir. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many. So many. There's so uh, many. Valerie Valdez and Premium Muhammad both finished their trilogies this year. So ch Chilling Effect and, um, oh gosh, Beneath the, wait, Beneath the Rising. Yeah. Sorry, I've got them over there. I knew once oh. you guys started, it would be impossible to stop. This is awesome. Keep going, Lena. <laughs> I have um, Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood. I know I mentioned it earlier, but the Mad Adam trilogy, like really great. And I'm pretty sure an adaptation is coming from HBO. So it's a good time to watch or to read those. Um, Essa Hansen's, she's got two books in the trilogy right now, No Fet Gloss. And I can't remember the second one offhand. They are trippy. They are so, those are the trippiest books. Okay. Okay. The tower, there's the tower trilogy. Um, yeah, and, and they're they're exactly what you're talking about, Kat, in terms of breaking and seams and worlds. They are just wonderful. So I highly recommend those. Awesome. Trina Sumner Smith. I'm writing all these down. I'm sure other people too. <laughs> um, cool. Okay. And Gary says The Spare Man by Kowal. Yeah, uh, Mary Cabanet Cole's mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Spare Man. Um, and Arcady Martins, um, A Memory of Empire and a Desolation Called Peace. I thought the first one was amazing. And then the second one happened. I was like, oh no, how are you going to top that? Huh. So I'm kind of waiting for that third one too. But she's <laughs> amazing. I mean, her world builds are, they're cool. Yeah, I should have said we should crowdsource this too. So if any of our attendees, if you have any recommendations, please put them in the chat. I'll send it out, a list out with um, our with our recap tomorrow. And so the last question really is just what's up next for you? What can we expect? What can we look forward to? And I believe I'm starting with Kat on this one. Mm, um, oh, wait, did I skip you last time? I know, go ahead. No, you didn't. 
Um, I don't think I actually answered the question last time. I don't, I don't dream about my stuff. Um, what's <laughs> next is going to be, can I do magic in space? Um, can, can I, and I'm, I'm looking for the seam that I need to break right now. I've got the world sort of percolating in the background, but I'm looking, I'm, I'm waiting for that, that moment mm -hmm. where I know how it's going to work. Generation ship. Okay. <laughs> I'll be looking forward to that book. Lena? Yeah, um, I'm actually going to try to attempt the same thing, magic in at least an alien planet. Uh, it's sort of a Mad Max, like apocalyptic type world that you sort of start to suspect is actually more like an alien planet with humans living on it in a far future. But I want magic. I want fantasy. I want the gunslinging and the Fury Road, but I also want like X-Men powers. I'm trying to reconcile that. Um, so it's it's a struggle, but that's definitely going to be the next series that I tackle. And I'm also working on my game. So putting together the soundtrack and making interactive maps for it and everything. So it's going to be like a fantasy game when it comes out. So I'm excited for that. Excellent. Uh, Sarah in the chat did ask about your video games. We'll be looking forward to them. Mur? Um, I am putting the final draft, or what I hope is the final draft, uh, working on that for um, the second book in my Midsolar Murder series called uh, Chaos Terminal. So I'll be polishing that up and hopefully turning it in before the end of the year. Excellent. And Julie? I am, after four years of science fiction, going to be doing at least two years of fantasy. I've got three fantasy novels contracted to write, and they have nothing to do with science fiction. They are absolutely wild magic, and Charles de Lintish, and Jane Austen Manners, and there's toads and dragons. It's going to be wonderful fun. Oh, oh gosh. That sounds like wonderful fun. So we're getting a few more recommendations in the chat, which is awesome. But um I do want to say thank you so much for being part of this conversation. All of you are so intensely interesting. I could just go on for like another hour or two, um, but people probably need to go to bed or something. So, um, you know, remember you can buy signed books from our authors from Bankscore Books. Obviously, they are going to be wonderful and great gifts if you would like. Um, and we will look forward to your books and we'll be, I, my TBR pile just fell over. I think you heard that sound earlier. <laughs> So thank you again for being here and thank everybody. I, I appreciate everybody spending their time with us this evening. So to all the attendees, um, thanks for coming out and happy reading. Thank everybody. you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.